This edition of the Riddler Report is brought to you by... Freaking.com Within the Liberty community, this endless debate continues. When, if ever, is it right to use deadly violence against the government? At least we've graduated past the point where, you know, people used to think it's only the, the ballot box or the bullet box, and those are the only two options for resisting the government. The liberty movement appears to have discovered civil disobedience as a third way, but the fact is there are probably many nuanced intermediate steps between civil disobedience and deadly violence. In the conflict with the Soviet Union, uh, Jean Kirkpatrick, uh, the American UN, UN ambassador, used to say, you want to have as many intermediate steps as possible available between peace and nuclear war. Like, you, you, you wouldn't want to be in a situation where the only tools you had were sort of the nuclear option tools and the doing nothing tools. Well, in the same way as the authoritarian darkness continues to uh, fall over America, you'd want to have more options than just politics, or civil disobedience, or uh, deadly violence, as, as defenses. The people should be able to provide proportionate responses to, well, not just, a, not just proportionate, but appropriate and ethical responses to each type of provocation the government might commit against them. So, rather than present this as an escalating series of options, I want to go in the opposite direction. I want to start with discussing the option which I condemn and then work my way backwards to uh, you know toward, you know, options that are less and less condemnable. So the the most condemnable and wicked type of anti-government violence would be the indiscriminate terrorist type violence. Uh, Timothy McVeigh and the Oklahoma City bombing would be a good example if in fact the official story is true about that. Uh, the guy apparently took no effort at all to even limit the number of innocent casualties. Somewhat more difficult to condemn, but still condemnable, is the practice of targeted deadly violence, like you see with this crowdsourced hit list of government officials that you see on the dark web, you know, like the hit that's out on Ben Bernanke, supposedly. The are the 9-11 truther who I think shot some Pentagon guards a couple, three years ago. I think he was a truther. Of course, in practice, completely innocent people have a way of getting killed in those types of situations, too, which I think was what happened when the TSA, the anti-TSA gunman went and tried to shoot TSA agents and ended up shooting, in addition, I think, a passenger. This is a problem with allegedly targeted violence, is that, especially deadly types of violence, it, it tends to uh, deadly the innocent, too. Although it's interesting to note how there really has not been, you know, these these actions, you would think they would create a huge public backlash uh, against at least Alex Jones and, and the truthers and, and maybe even the liberty movement. Uh, but these attacks that, you know, have been apparently politically motivated have not, have not really done that, as best I can tell. Doesn't make them right. But it does tell me that the public, if it's willing to sort of halfway tolerate that sort of thing, or at least doesn't go into a frenzy over it, it tells me that the public probably would support the uh, the the, the uh, one you know one step down the escalator, uh, uh, the slightly less condemnable uh, practice of non-deadly violence. And people don't talk about this very much, but remember the uh, remember the pie. People, the folks that used to go up to politicians and just just push a pie in their face, or the Iraqi reporter who just took his th shoes off and threw them at George Bush. Now that's not civil disobedience, and it's not deadly violence. It's almost like midway between the two. I mean, someone who's planning to kill uh, government people ought to maybe think about you know this being a less bad option. Then there's the example of the Danish resistance in World War II. Uh, they wanted to limit German reprisals against the civilian population. The Germans would just kill civilians at random if they suffered uh, guerrilla attacks that killed 
German soldiers. So the Danes focused on primarily sabotage of non-lethal variety. So no effort at all to cause any direct harm to any person. Well, I mean, some of the saboteurs took that approach. And that's an option that's hardly been explored at all. Uh, the, uh, there was an instance during the Ed Brown standoff where the authorities had set up a camera to monitor people coming in and out of the area of the property. Uh, I guess it was on, the, on a road. So someone just stole it. This is the kind of thing that makes the government look a little bit impotent without actually uh, creating any public sympathy for them or, or hurting anyone. Although, I don't know, maybe I'm being a little inconsistent here. Uh, I guess if someone stole your camera, you'd feel like you'd been hurt. I I'm not really sure if it does hurt the federal government uh, physically to, uh, for them to have a camera stolen. I mean, they printed the money that they used to buy the camera. Sun Tzu said, Bring your own supplies, but forage on the enemy. One cartload of his provisions is worth 20 of ours. What, if anything, is the appropriate time to begin taking things back from the government? Peaceably repossessing them in a guerrilla fashion? A peaceable guerrilla fashion? I don't know. But again, I do know that it's less bad than killing people. From there, we fall back to the even less controversial concept of uh, symbolic sabotage, where you're not really harming anything, but maybe there's eggs on a politician's house, or it's teepeed, or uh, graffiti appears on public buildings, or uh, street signs, or streets themselves. And really, I shouldn't say we fall back, uh, because I guess what would be happening is if there were an escalating authoritarian situation, you'd be seeing these kinds of things happen before the previous step that I mentioned. So you would presumably see actions like this uh, as a stopgap between something like civil disobedience and something like sabotage. Again, by and large, the American people have shown great restraint and by and large they have avoided violence against authorities. But if they're going to do it, it would be so much less bad if they explore these non-lethal options rather than just jumping into full-blown full violent revolution. Now to go one step further down the escalator, we start getting into things that have actually happened on a regular basis, say in New Hampshire. Uh, for instance, uh, protests outside the homes of uh, judges and politicians. I shouldn't say they've happened on a regular basis, but they certainly haven't repeatedly. Obviously, such a protest does not necessarily presage a, uh, an escalation to egging and uh, toilet paper raids since we've had, you know, three or f uh, at least four that I know of in New Hampshire since I moved there, and th none have ever been followed up by egging or anything like that. And uh, finally, we get kind of the bottom of the escalator. The, the spot where we kind of are now, where, uh, where, where this, this is the kind of thing that's happening almost constantly, and that is uh, media creation, or letters to the editor. Basically, it's sort of kind of one step up the ladder from civil disobedience, I guess you could say. The escalation ladder. Uh, it's, not, I mean, it's not more escalatory than civil disobedience necessarily, but... I, I guess it's something you graduate to after civil disobedience. Civil disobedience is something a movement can use to get attention, or an individual can when he has trouble getting attention. But uh, we, we in New Hampshire have sort of graduated to this point where we're pretty good at getting attention now without having to make the sacrifice of civil disobedience. I, I still wish there were more of it, more civil disobedience, and especially more textbook civil disobedience where people publicly announce their intentions in advance and, and, and inform the authorities what they'll be doing. Anyway, that's sort of my ladder. I may think of other uh, options that need to be inserted into this ladder that I hadn't already thought of, but I think the primary point is that you want to, if possible, stay on the lowest rung of the ladder that will get the job done. That way it minimizes risk to our enemies, 
who we are supposed to care about, whether they're our enemies or not. It minimizes unnecessary risk to us, and hopefully it keeps a substantial portion of public opinion on our side. The problem, of course, is that there is safety and risk and risk and safety. So if you stay too low on the ladder, for instance, if you stay at politics and you're always using politics and never graduating to anything else, or only civil disobedience or only media creation, you might be ineffective and you might also be boring. That's the allure for some people of going further up that escalator. But in any case, an escalator is exactly what it is. It's not a jump. You don't have to go from a ballot box straight to bullet box. You don't have to go from civil disobedience straight to bullet box. Please stay on the lowest rung that will get the job done. Keene, New Hampshire, the capital of libertarian civil disobedience. The folks over at freekeen.com believe this is the place you should be. If you believe in peaceful non-cooperation, freekeen.com invites you to the beautiful hills of western New Hampshire and invites you to join their peaceful evolution. Freekeen.com